was awarded carer's allowance. When she finally received her state pension, after decades of paying into the system, she was shocked to find she was no longer eligible for carer's allowance. How can it be right that when they hit pension age, carers, 72% of whom are women, are no longer eligible for support? Apologies, Mr Speaker. Um, I will take up her point with the Department for Work and Pensions. We are now uh, coming to questions to the Prime Minister. I, hi, Prime Minister. I will first call the Prime Minister to answer the engagements question one, and then I will call Sigurri Streeter to ask his supplementary. <laughs> Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I am sure members of the House will want to join me in offering our condolences to the family and friends of our former colleague Brian Binley, uh, who died over Christmas and uh, who was an irrepressible member, Mr Speaker, of this House. Mr Speaker, today uh, we are publishing our proposals for reforming the Mental Health Act. For too long we have seen rising rates of detention that not only had little beneficial effect, but left some worse off, not better off. That is why we are making sure the Act works better for, the, for some of the most vulnerable in our society and gives them more of a legal right in deciding what treatment works best for them. And my right honourable friend, the Health Secretary, will update the House shortly. And Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. And in addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. We had no head to South West Devon with Suguri Street to Suguri. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I know the whole House will want to associate itself with the Prime Minister's remarks about our dear uh, Brian Binley. Um, Mr Speaker, one of the groups hit hardest by the pandemic is young people in full-time education, especially those facing exams last year and this, with all of the mental health challenges that come from such uncertainty. Does my right honourable friend agree that those for whom exams have been scrapped this year would now benefit from the utmost clarity about how exactly they will be assessed? A clear plan, announced early, without last-minute changes, to help teachers and students prepare for an even more challenging experience. Thank you. Well, uh, my, my right honourable friend is absolutely right. And there is a, uh, a, a clearly a problem of differential uh, learning that has grown over the last uh, uh, few months and risks being exacerbated now by the current lockdown. And we'll uh, do everything we can to ensure that uh, exams uh, are fair, that the, the ways of testing uh, are set out in a timely way and uh, the Department for Education is launching a consultation uh, with Ofqual uh, to uh, ensure that we get the right arrangements for this year. We now come to the Leader of the Opposition, Right Hon. Keir Starmer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I join the condolences expressed by the Prime Minister, I'm sure, on behalf of the whole of the um, House? Can I also, Mr Speaker, begin by paying tribute to all of those involved in the vaccine programme? I went to the Newham Vaccine Hub last week and it was really uplifting to see the NHS, the Red Cross and lots of volunteers all working together and giving real hope. They had a simple message to me which is if they had more vaccine uh, they could and they would do more and I'm sure that's shared across the country. Um, I welcome news that's come out this morning about a pilot of 24-7 vaccine centres. I anticipate there's going to be huge clamour for this. So can the Prime Minister tell us when will the 24-7 vaccine centres be open to the public, because I understand they're not at the moment, and when will they be rolled out across the country? Uh, well, I'm uh, grateful to the uh, Right Honourable Gentleman for what he says about the, the rollout of vaccines, and I can tell him that uh, we'll be uh, going to 24-7 uh, uh, as soon as uh, we can, and uh, the right, my Right Honourable Friend, the Health Secretary, will be setting out uh, more about that in, in due course. And as he rightly says, uh, at the moment, the limit is on uh, supply. Uh, we have a huge network, 233 hospitals, 1,000 uh, GP surgeries, uh, 200 uh, pharmacies and 50 uh, mass vaccination centres. And uh, they are going, uh, as uh, he has seen himself, uh, exceptionally fast. I pay tribute uh, to their work. And uh, it's thanks to uh, 
uh, the, the work of the NHS and to the vaccine task force uh, that we have secured uh, more doses, I think, uh, per capita than virtually any other country in the world, certainly more than any other country in Europe. Keir Starmer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I obviously welcome that and urge the Prime Minister and the Government to get on with this. We're all happy to help, and there are many volunteers who are, the sooner we have 24-7 vaccine centres, the better for our NHS and the better for our economy. Mr Speaker, the last PMQs was on the 16th of December. The Prime Minister told us then that we were seeing, in his words, a significant reduction in the virus. He told us then that there was no need for endless lockdowns and no need to change the rules about Christmas mixing. Since then, since that last PMQs, 17,000 people have died of COVID. 60,000 people have been admitted to hospital. And there's been over a million new cases. How did the Prime Minister get it so wrong? And why was he so slow to act? Well, Mr Speaker, of course, what he fails to, to point out is that uh, on the 18th of December, uh, two days later, uh, the uh, government was informed of the spread of the, of the new variant and the uh, fact that it spreads uh, roughly 50 to 70 per cent faster than the, uh, the old variant. And uh, that is why it is indeed uh, correct to say that the situation today is uh, very troubling indeed. We have 32,000 COVID patients in hospital. The NHS is under huge strain. And Mr Speaker, I would like to take this opportunity uh, to pay tribute to all the staff, the doctors, the nurses, everybody working now in our NHS who are uh, doing an extraordinary job under the most challenging possible circumstances uh, to help those uh, who so desperately need it. And I thank them for what they are, they are doing. But at the same time, I also want to, to thank all those involved in what is the biggest vaccination programme in the history of this country, where once again uh, the, uh, the NHS is in the lead, working with the army and, and the legion of uh, volunteers and, uh, and everybody else. And that programme of vaccines, uh, Mr Speaker, does show the way forward. It does show how we're going to uh, come through this uh, pandemic. And uh, again, I repeat uh, my, uh, my gratitude to all those involved because they've now vaccinated 2.4 million people, delivered 2.8 million doses, uh, more than any other country in Europe. Uh, this is the toughest of times, Mr Speaker, but we can see the way forward. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister says that effectively two days after that PMQs, the advice changed. The truth is the indicators were all in the wrong direction back uh, at the last PMQs. But be that as it is made, the, the Prime Minister says he got that advice on the 18th of December, two days after PMQs. And we've all seen the sage minutes of the 22nd of December confirming the advice that was given to the government. Uh, the government's advisers warned the Prime Minister that the new variant was spreading fast and it was highly unlikely that November-style lockdowns would be sufficient to control it. Pretty clear advice on the 18th of December to the Prime Minister from SAGE, tougher lockdown than November is going to be needed. I've got the minutes here, everybody's seen them. Yet instead of acting on the 18th of December, the Prime Minister sat on his hands for over two weeks. We're now seeing in the daily figures the tragic consequences of that delay. So how does the Prime Minister justify delaying for 17 days after he got that advice on the 18th of December? Uh, well, uh, well, Mr Speaker, I, I, I must uh, disagree very uh, profoundly with what the right honourable gentleman has just said, because he knows very well that within 24 hours of getting the advice on uh, on the 18th about the, the spread of the new variant, we acted to put uh, the vast part of the country into much, much tougher measures. And uh, indeed, uh, they have what we are now seeing, and it's, it's very, very important uh, to, to stress that these are early days. Uh, we are now seeing the uh, the beginnings of some signs that that is starting to have an effect in, in, in many parts of the country, but by no means everywhere. And it is early days, Mr Speaker, and people must uh, keep their uh, discipline, keep enforcing uh, the rules, 
and uh, work together, as, uh, as I've said, to roll out uh, that vaccine uh, programme. But, Mr Speaker, I, I do recall that on the, on the day that we went into a, a national uh, lockdown, and sadly we were obliged to, uh, to shut the schools, uh, even on that day, uh, the Labour Party uh, was uh, advocating keeping schools open uh, for understandable reasons, uh, Mr Speaker, because we all want uh, to keep schools open, but I think it a bit much uh, to be uh, attacked uh, for taking tougher measures uh, to put this country uh, into the protective measures it needed when uh, the Labour Party were themselves uh, calling uh, them to keep schools open. Mr Speaker, just for the record, I wrote to the Prime Minister on the 22nd of December I hadn't seen the sage advice at that stage, saying to him, if it indicated there should be a national lockdown, he should do it immediately and he'd have our full support. I'll, I'll put that in the public domain so people can just check the record. But, Mr Speaker, more fundamentally, the Prime Minister says we took measures straight away, we put people into different tiers. The advice was a November-style lockdown is not enough. How on earth was putting people into a different tiered system an answer to the advice that was given? And isn't this the situation that every time there's a big decision to take, the Prime Minister gets there late? The next big decision is obvious. The current restrictions are not strong enough to control the virus. Stronger restrictions are needed. And it's no, it's no point members opposite shaking their heads. In a week or two, the Prime Minister is likely to be asking members to vote for this. So can the Prime Minister tell us, when infection rates are much higher than last March, when hospital admissions are much higher than last March, when death rates are much higher than last March, why on earth are restrictions weaker than last March? Uh, Mr Speaker, we, we keep things under a constant review and we will continue to do so. And certainly if there is any need to toughen up uh, restrictions, which I don't rule out, Mr Speaker, we will of course uh, we will, of course, come to this House, but uh, perhaps, as, as is so often the case, uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman didn't listen to my earlier answer, uh, because I pointed out to the House that actually the, the lockdown measures that we have in place, combined with the Tier 4 measures that we are using, are starting to show signs of, of some effect, and we must take account of that too, Mr Speaker, because nobody can doubt the serious damage that is done uh, by lockdowns to people's mental health, uh, to jobs, uh, to livelihoods as well. Uh, and Mr Speaker, uh, if to listen to the right honourable gentleman over the last 12 months, you'd, you'd think he had absolutely no other policy except to plunge this country into 12 months uh, of lockdown. And as for, as for, as for coming, uh, coming too late to things, Mr Speaker, I think it's, it was only a few weeks ago uh, that he was attacking the vaccine task force that has secured uh, the very doses, the millions uh, of doses that have put this country into the comparatively favourable position that we now find ourselves. Yeah. I'm a it's just not true. I've, every time I've spoken about the vaccine, I've supported it. But the Prime, Minister say, the Prime Minister says we're balancing health restrictions and the economy. And yet we ended 2020 with the highest death toll in Europe and the deepest recession in any major economy. So that just isn't a good enough answer. Mr Speaker, I want to turn to the latest free school meals scandal. We've all seen images on social media of disgraceful food parcels for children, costed at about £5 each. That's not what the government promised. It's nowhere near enough. So can I ask the Prime Minister, would he be happy with his kids living on that? And if not, why is he happy for other people's kids to do so? Well, Mr Speaker, I don't think anybody in this House is happy with the uh, disgraceful images that we've seen of the food parcels that have been offered. They are appalling. They're an insult to the families uh, that have received them. And I'm grateful, by the way, to Marcus Rashford, who highlighted the, uh, the issue and is doing quite an effective job by comparison with the Right Honourable Gentleman uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in holding the government to account for, uh, for these issues. And uh, the company in question has rightly apologised and agreed to, uh, to reimburse. But it is because we want uh, it's because we want to see uh, our kids properly fed throughout this very difficult uh, pandemic uh, that we've massively increased uh, the value of, uh, of what we're providing, another £170 million in the Covid winter grant scheme. 
£220 million more for the holiday activities and food programme, and uh, we're now rolling out the national free school meal voucher scheme as we did uh, in March uh, to give uh, parents uh, the choice to give kids the food that they need. Under this government, we will do everything we can to ensure that no child goes hungry as a result of the privations caused by this pandemic. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister says that the parcels are disgraceful, but it shouldn't have taken social media to shame the Prime Minister into action. Like the Education Secretary, he blames others, and he invites me to hold him to account. So, so let, let me do that, because blaming others, Prime Minister, is it, it's not as simple as that, is it? Because I've checked the government guidance on free school meals, the current guidance, published by the Department of Education. I've got it here. It sets out example parcel for one child for five days. Department of Education, Prime Minister, you want to be held to account. One loaf of bread, two baked potatoes, block of cheese, baked beans, three individual yogurts. Sound familiar? That's the images, Prime Minister, you just called disgraceful. The only difference I can see in this list and what the Prime Minister has described as disgraceful is a tin of sweet corn, a packet of ham and a bottle of milk. So he blames others. But this is on his watch. The truth is, families come last under this government, whether it's exams, free school meals or childcare. Will the Prime Minister undertake, he wants to be held to account, to, to take down this guidance by the close of play today and ensure that all of our children can get a decent meal during the pandemic? Speaker, I, the, the right honourable gentleman's words would be less hypocritical and absurd if it were not for the fact that the... Sorry, the I, I don't believe anybody's a hypocrite in this chamber. I think we need to be a little bit careful about what we're saying to each other. There was a not truth earlier and there was also comparisons to others. Please, let's keep the discipline in this chamber and the respect for each other. We're tidying up how this parliament behaves and I certainly expect the leadership of both parties to ensure that takes place. Prime Minister, would you like to withdraw hypocrisy? I am delighted to be advised by you, Mr Speaker. Let me confine my, uh, my criticism to the absurdity of the, which I th hope is acceptable, Mr Speaker, of the right honourable gentleman uh, attacking us over free school meals when it was a Conservative government that instituted uh, free school meals, universal free meals, not a, not a, not a Labour government, and, uh, and, of the, and of the 280 billion that we have spent securing the jobs and the livelihoods of people across this country, uprating uh, universal credit, uh, increasing, uh, and, 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 and in addition increasing the living wage by record amounts this year and, and last year, increasing local housing allowance. The, the overwhelming majority, the bulk of the uh, measures, uh, the benefits fall uh, for, in, in favour of the poorest and the neediest in society, which is what this House uh, would expect. And, and Mr Speaker, he takes one position one week, uh, one position the next. That is what he does. That's been his whole lamentable approach throughout this, if I can get away with lamentable, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, throughout this uh, pandemic. And uh, he says he supports the vaccine now. He says he supports the vaccine rollout uh, and, and he goes and tries to associate himself uh, with it because he senses uh, that it is going well. But don't be in no doubt, Mr. Speaker, that was the party that wanted us, this country, to stay in uh, the European Union uh, vaccine programme. He stood further, he stood on yeah, absolutely true, he stood on a manifesto. Um, he stood on a manifesto which he has not repudiated, Mr Speaker, uh, to dismantle the very pharmaceutical companies that have created this miracle of science, which is true. Prime Minister, there are questions and sometimes we've got to try and answer the question to what was asked of you. I think to run through the history is one thing. But in fairness, it is Prime Minister's questions, but I would say it was the final question. We've got lots of others to go through. So I think what I'm going to do now is move on to Simon Jupp in Sidmouth, who's desperate to ask a question of you, Prime Minister. Simon Jupp. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The hospitality industry is the lifeblood of East Devon. Our pubs, restaurants, cafes and hotels provide thousands of jobs, places to meet and places to stay. The generous support package now put in place will tide many of these businesses over for now, but they will need further support. Will my right honourable friend consider extending the VAT cut for hospitality to give them a helping hand when they're back open for business? Oh, well, I'm, I'm grateful to my uh, honourable friend, and I know that uh, uh, my right honourable friend, the Chancellor, has done everything he can 
to help businesses throughout this uh, pandemic, and that's why uh, he's extended uh, the uh, the grants, and uh, that's why we've uh, got the cuts for both for VAT and for and for business rates. And we will do everything we can uh, to help uh, as we go forward. But the best thing uh, would, of course, be to ensure that we roll out this vaccine program and bounce back as fast as possible. Any further announcements uh, my right honourable friend uh, makes will be uh, uh, well ahead. Of the uh, well, of, of, well ahead of the 31st of March, by which we intend to have a budget. Let's head up to Scotland to the leader of the SNP with Ian Blackford. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My constituent in Loch Aber, a producer and exporter of shellfish, is experiencing his worst nightmare. After loading a lorry of fresh local seafood on Monday, as he's done for 35 years, his driver faced bureaucracy and delays. Brexit red tape now means that £40,000 of his fresh, high-quality produce is lost, unable to be sold. Mr Speaker, that £40,000 produce is income for over 100 local families in many remote and fragile communities. Can the Prime Minister tell my constituent, where is the sea of opportunity that he and his Scottish Tories promised? Prime Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, we're putting £100 million into supporting uh, the fishing industry in Scotland and across the whole of the of the UK, and it is the policy of the Scottish Nationalist Party uh, t- not just to uh, go to break up the United Kingdom uh, under their harebrained scheme, but also uh, to take Scotland back into the EU and hand back control uh, of Scottish fisheries uh, to Brussels, uh, thereby throwing away all those opportunities in a way that I think uh, the right honourable gentleman himself opposite uh, would say was totally absurd. And uh, I'm amazed that he continues on this track. Returning to Ian Blackford. Ian Blackford. I'm amazed that the Prime Minister continues to traduce the name of the Scottish National Party. He's been told before and he really should get it right. And frankly, that answer was an insult to all fishermen that are facing loss today. The reality is, Mr Speaker, that a third of the Scottish fishing fleet is tied up in harbour. Some boats are landing in Denmark rather than Scotland to avoid Brexit bureaucracy. Scottish seafood exporters are losing upwards of £1 million in sales a day. Seafood Scotland says all the extra red tape is an almost impossible task. It's even forced ferry operators to pause load deliveries to the continent. Mr Speaker... The European Union have put in place a five billion fund to support businesses with the cost of Brexit. Last night, it was re- revealed that Ireland is receiving one billion of it. Can the Prime Minister tell Scottish business when they will be getting the same level of support and where is the compensation for my constituent that's losing forty thousand pounds today? Uh, Mr. Speaker, he c- continually advocates uh, the the breakup of the uh, union with the United Kingdom. And uh, he continually advocates uh, going back into the into the, the European Union, even though that would be immensely destructive to the uh, to the Scottish, uh, immensely destructive to the Scottish economy, to jobs, to livelihoods, to pensions, uh, to the currency. Uh, and as far as I understand it, they're they're already spending money in Scotland on Indie Ref Two, what they call Indie Ref Two, uh, when they should be getting on. Uh, Scottish nationals should be getting on with fighting the pandemic. That, I think, is what the people uh, of Scotland uh, want to see. And he might pay tribute, by the way, to the merits of the United Kingdom in rolling out a vaccine across the whole of the of the country. Uh, and I'm told, by the way, Mr Speaker, that they can't even bring themselves to say the Oxford uh, AstraZeneca uh, vaccine. Perhaps he could, perhaps he could just say uh, that he likes the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. Yeah. Well, let us move to Yorkshire instead with Julian Sturdy. Julian Sturdy. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, With the vaccination programme making very encouraging progress, can the Prime Minister reaffirm that lifting restrictions to return to normal as soon as it is safe is an overriding national priority? And can I invite him to consider drawing a line in the sand in terms of vaccination of sufficient numbers of the priority group? the reaching of which will trigger a phased relaxation of controls as immunity widens. Minister. Uh, Yes, Mr Speaker, I can confirm that we're uh, going to go down the uh, top four priority 
groups who account for 88 percent, sadly, of, uh, of COVID deaths. Uh, the target is, as you know, is by the 15th of February, there will then be an opportunity to look very carefully at the measures that we have uh, in place and uh, will try to uh, reverse the restrictions as soon as we uh, reasonably can uh, in a way that doesn't involve overwhelming the NHS. Let's head to Northern Ireland with Sir Geoffrey Donaldson. Sir Geoffrey. The Prime Minister promised us that uh, Northern Ireland will continue to have unfettered access to the UK uh, internal market. And yet in my constituency, uh, consumers are facing empty supermarket shelves. Uh, they can't get parcels delivered from Great Britain. Uh, small businesses can't uh, bring uh, spare parts uh, and raw materials into Northern Ireland from Great Britain. Uh, steel importers are facing uh, tariffs. Uh, and we have many other problems, all caused by the Northern Ireland Protocol. So what I and the people of Northern Ireland need to know from the Prime Minister as leader of the United Kingdom is what his government is going to do to address this, uh, if he will consider invoking Article 16 of the Northern Ireland Protocol to resolve these issues, uh, because the Trader Support Service is welcome, but it isn't the solution alone. We need direct government intervention to deal with this now. Well, I, th I thank the right honourable gentleman. I can, I can tell him that at the moment goods are flowing effectively and in normal volumes between uh, Great Britain and Northern Ireland. So far, no lorries have been turned back. Uh, yes, of course, there are, uh, there are teething problems. And uh, what I can say, what I can confirm to him, is that uh, if there are problems that we believe uh, are disproportionate, then we will have no hesitation in invoking Article 16. Let's well, head to Rushliff with Ruth Edwards. Ruth Edwards. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. May I congratulate my right honourable friend on his trade deal with the EU and welcome the prospect of a more global approach to our trading policy. Would he agree with me that a free port based at East Midlands Airport, connected to the world by trains, planes and automobiles, and focused on generating green growth, is key to the success of global Britain? Uh, well, I, I'm delighted that she's campaigning for a free port. I'm a passionate supporter of, uh, of free ports. Uh, they will be uh, a, a process, as she, as she knows, and successful applicants uh, will be announced in the spring. Let's head up to St Albans with Daisy Cooper. Daisy Cooper. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I hope that the Prime Minister will join with me in congratulating the local GPs and all the admin, medical and volunteer staff who have set up the Batchford Hall Vaccination Centre in St Albans at incredible speed. They have already vaccinated thousands of residents, but their enormous local drive and success is being hampered because they are only being provided with enough vaccine supplies to vaccinate 1,100 people a day for just two days a week. And they are often only getting the vaccine deliveries at very short notice. So will the Prime Minister personally intervene to ensure that the Batchford Hall Vaccination Centre in St Albans and all PCN-led local vaccine services have a much greater and more consistent vaccine supply so they can get on with the job of vaccinating the country against Covid? Uh, well, I, I certainly thank the uh, the GP Vaccination Centre in, uh, in St Albans for what they're doing and for uh, for. Their, their wonderful work uh, and it's thanks to, as I say, to uh, primary care networks across the country that we've done 2.8 million uh, vaccines, uh, 2.4 million uh, people uh, and the constraint is, is not the, uh, the, uh, the distribution network, it is the, the supply but don't forget uh, that we have uh, a bigger supply than uh, most other European, all other European uh, countries. Uh, indeed, we've virtually done as many as, all, as many vaccines as all other European countries uh, put uh, together. Uh, and we will be ramping up that, that supply in the, in the days and weeks ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Will the Prime Minister mean thanking Shropshire's defence engineers, both in the public sector and the private sector, currently working on the Warrior and Boxer military vehicle programmes, doing a great job. But as the government considers making a decision on the Challenger 2 life extension programme, will you bear in mind that excellent workforce in Shropshire that have had such a history and a modern day practice of delivering UK defence? Uh, of course, Mr Speaker, I'm familiar with the superb uh, workforce in, in Shropshire to which he uh, refers. Uh, and, uh, and of course, there is a uh, a, a, a competition uh, currently going on, negotiations going on with the, uh, the modernisation that, uh, that he speaks of. Um, as he knows, we've made the biggest investment in our defences since the, uh, the Cold War. 
uh, with the recent uh, spending review, uh, but it would not be right for me to comment on these uh, negotiations at this stage. Let's head to Hornsey and we'll agree with Catherine West. Catherine West. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Prime Minister, widening inequalities are tearing communities apart and COVID's made things much, much worse. In Hornsey and Wood Green, we have a 182% increase in joblessness. Today, will the Prime Minister pledge to reverse the planned £1,000 per annum cut to universal credit to provide a certain future to all of those increasing numbers of people who use universal credit as a lifeline? Uh, well, Mr Speaker, not only have we uh, upgraded, uh, upgraded universal credit by £1,000, uh, but as, uh, as I've said, we've ex extended, uh, uh, the, uh, increased the local housing allowance, uh, increased the living wage, uh, many, many other benefits. We will keep all of this under constant uh, review. But I may say that uh, I know that she speaks for the, uh, for the, uh, the uh, Labour uh, front bench. Uh, the lab current Labour policy, as far as I understand it, is to abolish a universal credit. Uh, and I think many people in receipt uh, of universal credit, uh, knowing how important it is, will find that uh, stunning uh, in view of what she's just said. To Brigham Gould with Andrew Percy. Andrew Percy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, here in the in East Yorkshire and North Lincolnshire in the Humber, we have some of the highest flood risk uh, in the country, and we're still waiting for the report into the flooding on the River Air at East Carrick and Snaith, just up the road from me uh, here, which took part ten months ago. Uh, I welcome the doubling of flood defence funding. Um, uh, it is most welcome in an area particularly such as mine, but we often come up against the challenges of bureaucracy and sometimes the Treasury funding rule. So can I ask the Prime Minister to look at what more can be done to reduce the red tape in bringing schemes forward and what we can do to, whilst I appreciate the need for national agencies, also utilise local um, uh, uh, flood lead flood councils or drainage boards by providing them with direct cash as well as to the Environment Agency to bring forward uh, projects that will protect homes and people. Prime Minister. Yes. Um, well, my, my honourable friend makes a really excellent point about the uh, need to improve uh, flood de defences, and that's why uh, we're investing £2.6 billion uh, in 1,000 flood defences uh, in England uh, in the next uh, few years, in the next uh, six years. Uh, and uh, the Humber Estuary, the, uh, the area that uh, uh, he represents so well, is one of four areas uh, which will uh, benefit from uh, trials into long-term ways of uh, uh, making uh, all our country uh, more resistant uh, to flooding. Let's head to Kevin Brennan in Cardiff. Kevin Brennan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. There's real disappointment that a reciprocal work permit free deal for touring musicians and performers has not been agreed with the EU. No one's interested in a blame game. It's clearly fixable and in Britain's economic and cultural interest to do so quickly, but it needs leadership from the top. So will the Prime Minister meet on this virtually with a small group of MPs, including the Conservative Chair of the Culture Select Committee? We're all singing from the same song sheet. Will he please say yes to the meeting? I will, of course, ensure that uh, there is a proper meeting uh, with the Honourable Gentleman and, uh, and, his, and his colleagues on this subject, which is extremely uh, important. And I know that our, our friends in the EU will uh, be wanting to go further to improve uh, things for both, not, not just for, for, for musicians, uh, but for business travellers of all kinds. But there is a, there is a mutual benefit. Mr. Speaker, for the first time in my lifetime, we are now a fully sovereign and independent nation. So I'd like to thank the Prime Minister on behalf of the people of Redcar and Cleveland for getting Brexit done. As the, as the member for Rushcliffe pointed out, one of the key benefits of Brexit is our ability to create 10 new free ports. And in Teesside, we have the largest brownfield development site in Europe, the deepest port on the East Coast, a fantastic Tees Valley met in Ben Houchen, and a plan to create 15,000 jobs over the next 20 years. So does he agree with me that the best place for our first post-Brexit free port is Teesside. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so there's been a bit of a theme to these, uh, the, these, these interventions from my brilliant uh, uh, free port campaigners uh, uh, behind me. Uh, they're absolutely right. We don't hear from, uh, about it from the, from the party opposite. Uh, but Mr Hydrogen, as I, as I think the, my honourable friend is, is now known, makes an excellent point. Uh, as I said earlier on, the bidding process is, is underway and it would be wrong with me uh, to comment any further. Let's head up to Kingston Ponnell with Carl Turner. Carl Turner. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to join my right honourable and learned friend, the Leader of the Opposition, in paying tribute to those involved in the vaccine rollout. But, Mr. Speaker, the Yorkshire Post highlighted this week that many of the country's 11,000 community pharmacies stand ready, willing and able to deliver desperately needed COVID vaccines. Yet his government have seemingly shunned an army of fully trained, experienced and registered technicians. Pharmacies like Witham Pharmacy in East Hull are at the forefront of the flu vaccine every single winter and are ready to play their part in the national effort. So will the Prime Minister now take control and fully mobilise the skills and expertise of community pharmacies to get Britain vaccinated? Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, there are 9,000 uh, fantastic community pharmacies across our, our country. They do an amazing job. Uh, what we want to, to ensure is that uh, we get doses to the places where they're going to be distributed most effectively, uh, the fastest. And, we'd, and I'm sure uh, the Honourable Gentleman wouldn't want to see uh, doses distributed to places, uh, many, many places where they might not all be used in the course of the day. We need at this stage uh, to avoid uh, any wastage at all. Uh, and that's why we're, we're concentrating, as I say, Mr Speaker, on the 233 hospitals, 50 mass vaccination sites, 200 pharmacies already, uh, Mr Speaker, and we will ramp that up and it will be particularly important uh, as we come into the phases when we need to uh, reach people uh, who are harder to reach in local communities and their local pharmacies uh, will, as he rightly says, play a vital role. Let's hand up to Norfolk with Duncan Baker. Duncan Baker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm sure the Prime Minister will join me in saying that we owe an enormous debt of gratitude to all our carers, including unpaid carers and young carers, and those throughout the social care profession for the tireless work they have done during the pandemic. And representing the oldest constituency demographic of North Norfolk, I firsthand have seen their work. Yet these professionals often feel forgotten about. This needs to change. Will the Prime Minister commit to a 10-year plan for social care to match the one for the NHS as the foundation to start reforming social care in this country. Uh, my honourable friend is absolutely right to highlight the extraordinary work that's done by carers, social uh, care workers up and down the country. They have got us through uh, this pandemic. We must continue to look after them in any way that we can and we must uh, commit, as, uh, as we have done, to reforming uh, the sector, giving people the certainty uh, that they need and we will be bringing forward proposals uh, later this year. I set up to Scotland with Gavin Newlands. Gavin Newlands. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. On Monday, thousands of British gas workers finished striking in protest at the threat of being fired and rehired on reduced terms and conditions. Of course, it was British Airways' shameful fire and rehire actions which prompted the Prime Minister to say he was looking at what he could do. He's also called for employers to display fairness and respect, but clearly that hasn't and isn't happening, uh, and he must now step up. I have a bill with cross-party support which would outlaw the practice so will you meet with me to discuss how we can provide more protection for all our workers? Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. And uh, we, uh, as he says, uh, we believe that using threats of firing and, and rehiring is unacceptable as a negotiating yeah. tactic. And there are, there are laws in place uh, to ensure that contractual uh, conditions uh, can't discriminate uh, against people on grounds of race or sex or, or disability. But I'll take up his, uh, his point by saying that the Department for Business is working uh, with ACAS, uh, businesses and employee representatives to discuss what more we can do. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Jay Fathers died in hospital having been stabbed in the early hours of New Year's Day. Last week, the killers of Dom Ansar and Ben Gillam Rice were sentenced to life imprisonment. Knife crime is destroying lives in Milton Keynes, across the Thames Valley, across the UK, even during the pandemic. Can my right honourable friend outline what support the government is giving to pro provide police forces with the tools they need to make our streets safer? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, uh, first of all, we're introducing knife crime uh, prevention orders that are placing curbs on uh, and, and limits uh, to deter young people from uh, going equipped and, and getting involved in, uh, in knife crime. Uh, we've 
uh, made sure that we uh, deliver on uh, the serious violence strategy, engaging with young people, steering them away uh, from, uh, from knife crime. But uh, it, what it takes is uh, continuous and serious law enforcement, uh, making sure that people who carry a knife uh, do get the sentences they deserve. And that's why uh, we're also putting more police out on the streets of our country and have recruited almost 6,000 of the additional uh, 20,000 that we committed to at the last election. I said to Cardiff with Anna McMorran. Anna McMorran. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Workers in Cardiff North and across the country are facing continued job insecurity. And as we've heard, shameless fire and rehire tactics, forcing British gas workers to take a stand against this and strike in the most difficult of circumstances.